I'm Rabbi Eric Tokager with Brit Am Messianic Synagogue in Pensacola, Florida. My co-host, Wayne Leland, Rabbi of Am Israel Messianic Synagogue in Navarre, Florida. And the phone number to call in the program today is 623-1330, 623-1330. Or you can message us by going to our Facebook page, In the Beginning Radio Program. And remember that In the Beginning is in quotation Marks. Rabbi Wayne, it's so good to be back actually in the studio live. Yes, I mean, I'm glad it's to see you. It's been a few weeks since, uh, since I've been on the radio, but uh, I'm glad to be back and excited to be uh, sharing once again the Word of God from an in the beginning perspective for our listeners to understand as the Bible is written from Genesis through the book of Revelation and not pick and choose as you want to go. But in order to understand the scripture, you look at the first part of the book and you build line upon line, precept upon precept through the book. So glad to be back and uh, Mm -hmm. hope that we get some phone calls today from our listeners at 623-1330. I do want to talk about a couple of things. One is that um, we're doing an Israel trip. Uh, you know, I'm the publisher of the Messianic Times newspaper, and, and the Messianic Times is doing a trip to Israel in November, on November 27th through December the 7th. The cost of this trip is less by almost a thousand dollars than last year's trip and the trip the year before. The price of oil has gone down. Flights are a little less. The oil, the uh, gas tax that they charge on flying internationally is is down and so uh, for those that have never experienced Israel never had the Bible go from black and white to living color as you walk in the places that you're uh, visiting we encourage you to come and sign up and be part of the Messianic Times trip to Israel that's this November 27th through December 7th now you'll notice that that is a 11 day period of time many trips to Israel either go for 7 days or 10 days but one of those days is actually a traveling day so you end up with 6 days of actual time in the land or 10 days of actual time in the land we actually schedule one extra day for traveling so we'll spend a full 10 days in Israel and the price is the same or less than many of the trips that you'll see uh, on advertised by other ministries so we encourage you if you'd love to go to Israel and you'd love to go to Israel with a messianic rabbi who uh, understands the land understands the scripture is going to teach in all of the different locations we're going to go to Capernaum we're going to go to Caesarea we're going to go to Caesarea Philippi we'll go to Jerusalem We'll spend time at the Dead Sea, at Qumran, at En Gedi, all the different places that we read about in Jaffa, in Tel Aviv, all the different places you read about in the Bible, and you'll have an opportunity to stand in those locations. For instance, in Capernaum, we go to uh, a synagogue where we know that Yeshua walked that ground. Uh, We know that he was there. He taught at the synagogue in Capernaum. We know where that is. We know that's the place where the lame man was laid in the bed and and they end up dropping the bed through the roof of the house that he was in. We know where this city was, where the synagogue was, where he did these miracles. And we actually get to go and be in those places. We get to go to... um, uh, Caesarea Philippi, also known as Banyas, which is where uh, he said the gates of hell shall not prevail against his kingdom. About and, and so these things, these places, we'll get to go and stand on and talk about and share from the scripture about. And, and so I encourage you, the trip is uh, is reasonably inexpensive comparably to other trips that you'll see advertised. Uh, and it's, uh, again, 11-day trip, so there's actual 10 full days in the land and uh, so it's always an exciting time and I encourage you if you've never been to Israel uh, it may also be an opportunity if if your pastor or your congregational leader has never been to Israel this might be a time for your congregation to get together and uh, send him I promise you that a trip to Israel will change the way that your pastor your rabbi your congregational leader teaches uh, the scripture so I encourage you 
uh, gather together and bless your leader with a trip to Israel. Have him come along with the Messianic Times trip to Israel. I also want to uh, once again remember that our opening and closing song is uh, sung by Natasha Krauss Reynolds. It's written, produced by Natasha uh, and Tamara Alexander and Jonathan Lane. And you can find out more about them by going to their CD Baby pages, which are posted on our In the Beginning radio program. Uh, Facebook page so you can follow up also I posted a link where you can find information about the Israel trip on the uh, the Facebook page also Jeannie welcome to the program um, thank you so much There's static on the line can you hear me yes ma'am okay um, I, I, I have a request actually I, I would love it if you guys would go back over um, just the beginnings of the early church, and um, I, I, you know, I talk to people, and they, they, they cite Galatians about the legalism, and they say, oh, and, and we talk about the fact that that is about circumcision, and then they'll say, okay, well, then Peter is about food, and it's, it's, I'm not as articulate and as knowledgeable, and so I'm. It, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm we'd love to share guys some guys of those things. So, and then go back and kind of do some uh, church history of how all that came about and how we lost it. So I'll be glad to share some, and I'm sure Rabbi Wayne will. Uh, Jeannie, one of the things that people don't recognize, you know, all the, uh, often you hear people say uh, say things about the New Testament church and such, but one of the two things the New Testament church never had was a New Testament or a church. That's right. And so it's it's important to understand that the believers we read about in the book of Acts when when it talks about the where we read in an English Bible the church of Corinth or the church of Galatia those the word church there is ecclesia which means uh the gathering or the assembly there the word church as in modern day form is a modern word that actually retrofits to the word it is doesn't actually translate it so all of the first believers the early believers were jewish people for at least 10 to 15 years then you had the samaritans which were from the northern kingdom uh the remnants of the northern kingdom the samaritans and then you had the gentiles that came with cornelius and his household and all of them uh became part of this grafted in uh, movement or the grafting in of the Gentiles and the Samaritans to the olive tree of Israel and not to a new group of people that came along. The, the establishment of separate Gentile gathering places uh, happened as a result of politics and taxes, not as a result of a move of God. In other words, the Jewish people were charged a Jew tax by Rome. In order to not become polytheistic and follow after the Roman gods, the Jews had to pay an additional tax. Well, when the Gentile believers uh, realized that, you know, we don't have to pay that tax, we're not Jews, and Rome had adjusted some of those things as time went on, they formed their own bodies separate from the synagogues or from the home groups, uh, and those groups ultimately later on through the establishment of the world or universal church, the Roman Catholic Church, became known as the church as opposed to part of the synagogal movement or the community movement of Judaism. But for the early years that we read about in the Brit Kadeshah or the New Covenant writings, all of that was done in a synagogal Judaic framework of keeping the feasts and festivals, of keeping Shabbat, of all those things. Now, we do read about the gathering together on the first day of the week, but if you read about that, you'll find that the references we have to the first day of the week often or, or always refer to a gathering of offerings or money. And part of that was that on Shabbat, the Jewish people didn't like to handle the Roman currency that had the Roman gods on it. So they wouldn't gather together on Shabbat and gather the money together. They would gather the offerings together after the Shabbat on the first day of the week. And those gatherings that we read are largely 
extensions of the Shabbat after Havdalah, after the closing of Shabbat, where they gathered the offerings and the money that they went and sent out to other congregations to help the poor, the needy, as well as the local congregation. So all of these things that were done were done under the con or in the context of the biblical Judaism of the uh, apostles and the disciples and those that uh, that we read about in the Brit Kadashah. We don't actually read of the establishment of what is known as the church in the Bible. Uh, we read of the ecclesia or the assembly, but that word ecclesia is the same, is the Greek alternative for the word kahal or kehila that means assembly that's used in the what's known as the Old Testament. So when they talk about and the assembly gathered around Moses, that's the same word and same usage as we see in the Brit Kadashah where it says and the ecclesia gathered together. So it's the same group of people, these followers of the God of Israel, uh, only in the Brit Kadashah they've also accepted the coming of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Messiah and his involvement uh, through the Ruach HaKodesh of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Okay, well, the, 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 one of the sticking points for people seem to be the food laws. They're going, well, that's going back under the law. And so uh, the, uh, the, new, the new believers <coughs> that came in, the, gen, the Gentiles that came in and became part of the commonwealth of Israel, um, were they keeping the food laws? And, and Absolutely. Absolutely. The argument against that people bring up is Peter's vision, where if you read Peter's vision, not only did Peter not eat, actually eat anything off of the sheet as it came down, but it also explains, as Peter kept thinking about this, it says, what God had made clean, call not unclean, speaking of the Gentiles and the opening the door for Peter to go speak to the Gentiles, share the good news, the gospel of Messiah. And then the Gentiles became believers, and they fellowshiped along with the Jewish people. The other one is where it talks about uh, Paul, who, uh, who speaks to Peter about Peter. You know, and Peter's there, and he's gathered with the Gentiles, and it says he's eating with the Gentiles. And Paul comes up, and, and there's this whole, you know, Peter walks away from the Gentiles because he doesn't want to be seen with them by these Jewish brethren that come. But the problem isn't about what they were eating. There's nothing in that verse that says they were eating anything that was unkosher. The issue was that the Jewish people did not fellowship. Go back to the Acts 10. It was against Jewish law for Jewish people to fellowship with Gentiles. And that was what the condemnation was about, not about what they were eating, but the very fact that Peter was sitting down and eating with Gentiles, although Peter was should have at that point understood that God had made them clean and shouldn't have worried about what Paul and the other Jews that came with him thought about it. He should have just explained to them that God said, through the unction of the Ruach HaKodesh in a vision that he had made the Gentile believers clean and therefore fellowship was acceptable. Matter of fact, when we read in Acts 15, the discussion is what requirements would we put on the Gentiles in order to be able to fellowship and the requirements that are given in Acts 15, there's four of them and it says things strangled, from uh, abstain from things strangled, from things uh, blood, from things offered to idols, and from fornication. And so we look at those four and say those are all things that had to be done for Gentiles to be able to fellowship with Jews because they were cleanliness those issues. Remember the Jews were still going to the temple at that time. They still were making offerings and sacrifices and doing those things. And they had to rem remain ritually clean in order to do those. But the next verse says, for Moses is taught in the synagogue every Shabbat. The Gentiles would be taught the Torah and their responsibility to the Torah every Shabbat. But in order for them to fellowship in the synagogue, in order for them to go, again, Acts 15 is about what do we look to the Gentiles to do. And it continues with the word, for they'll hear Moses taught in the synagogue every Shabbat. In other words, the Torah will be taught, and the expectation was that the Gentiles would be in synagogue on the Shabbat, 
and the requirements for them to be able to do that, three of the four had to do with kosher laws. Things strangled, blood, and things offered to idols are all part of the kosher code. So anyhow, we appreciate your call, Jeannie, and thank you so much for being part of the program. Chase, welcome to the program. Thanks for taking my call, gentlemen. Uh, we, we Chase, I can barely hear you. Is there a way oh. you can talk louder? Yes, sir. Um, let me just turn my Bluetooth up a little bit. Can you hear me a little bit better now? I can hear you a little better now, but if you could get louder, it would be even better. Okay. Uh, let me try it this way, too. All right. Is that a little bit better? Okay, that's a little better. All right. I just have one quick question, and then we'll come back to maybe discuss it another day. When the Bible, From Genesis to Revelation... Is the book in chronological order? No. And, and, okay. Oh, okay. That, that, was, that, was my, that was my only question. Um, yeah, I'll give you. I'll give you a good example, real quick. In the book okay. of Numbers, which is the part of the Torah that we're reading, you know, the the Torah is broken up into weekly sections, and this week we're reading the book of Numbers. Well, in the book of Numbers, at the beginning of chapter eight, it tells us what time of the year it is, and then when we go to chapter nine and ten. It goes back and tells us something that happened a month before because it says it begins by saying it's the second month of the second year. And then when we go to 10, it says, and God spoke to them and told them to observe the Passover in the, and which was a month before. So it's not say it's out of chronological order, but it's in the order God established it. And then when we get to chapter, I think it's 11 or 12, it goes back to the second month, the 20th day, which is 10 days into the time that we're reading, 10 days later from the beginning of the message that's in Numbers 9 that we're reading. So even in the individual books, it's not in chronological order, and neither is the uh, the Bible in chronological order, at, at least in the uh, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, and the books of the Brit Kadashah, the datings and times of the writings of those, for instance, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written somewhere between 65 and 68. I believe Galatians was written somewhere in the late 40s. So they're not in chronological order. Yes, sir. Only, the only reason why I asked was in the beginning um, when um, you and the brother was speaking on um, reading the Bible from front to back, line for line. And that's, and that's what y'all, you know. In, in y'all's opening, right as the show was coming on. Right. And, yes, sir. That's the only right, but what, I, what we're talking about is. If you're reading something in the New Testament yes, and you don't know what it said previously in the Old Testament, you're working out of order. You first start in the Old Testament. You start with the very first book in the, in the Old Testament, Genesis, and then you read on and you read in line upon line through the Bible. So in other words, if you're reading something in the New Testament, in order to understand it, you'd have to read the books that came before it. If you're reading, for instance... Um, something in Psalms, in order to understand Psalms, you would want to know everything that chronologically was said in the previous books to the when David and the other psalmists wrote Psalms. You couldn't start with Psalms and establish a, a teaching or a doctrine based upon Psalms. For instance, the Psalm that says God uh, desires... Uh, doesn't desire sacrifice, but desires a contrite heart and a broken spirit. It, in order to understand that, you first have to go back and find out what the sacrificial system was about. And the truth is, God would rather man not sin and be brokenhearted to him and, and, and humble himself before doing it than to prefer or make himself a God and thereby choose to obey his will instead of God's will and then have to make a sacrifice or have a sacrifice in order to cover it. But in order to understand the verse in Psalms, you would have to read the previous chronologically the previous, not necessarily chronological in order time-wise, but all of the books and all the things that were said beforehand. I have a good understanding. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's really important to understand these, and that really was a great question, mm -hmm. because many people don't know that the books of the Bible aren't in chronological order, and many people don't even know that the books of the Bible themselves, for instance, the example I use in Numbers, if you read the beginning of chapters 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you'll see that within those, just those chapters that we're reading this week, you'll see that the times bounce back and forth, because mm -hmm. 
God's word is written in a way where he chooses where to put the emphasis of the the words that are said and not just in chronological order itself. The book of Job, for instance, is one of the oldest books in the Bible, yet it's not in the very beginning of the Bible. So we have to understand those things as we look at the scripture. Some of the, uh, some of the scribes say that the book of Numbers actually is more like three books. Actually, in the partial part that we're on, uh, the way it's broken down, uh, of course, you know, we look at it as, as five books all the way through, but they say it's really like seven books. Right, well, the different uh, different writers lo- or uh, scholars mm-hmm. look at things different way. For instance, there are those, although I don't agree with it, there's mm-hmm. those that believe that there were actually two Isaiahs and that the first p- half of Isaiah was written by one person mm-hmm. and the last half of Isaiah was written by another person because they seemingly change mm-hmm. the way the writing is, the way the focus is. But there's a long time that goes mm-hmm. through, and as people mature, they, are, they do change how they think and how they write and sure. how they do things. So yeah. I don't have a problem believing yeah. that Isaiah was written by one person, although there are those that believe uh, that it may have been. Rabbi Wayne, we want to remind our, re- our listeners that Our program is sponsored and supported by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast, and one of those is your congregation. And so why don't you tell us about it, how people can find you, and what's going on in the upcoming weeks. Yes, our congregation is Am Israel Messianic Synagogue, and we meet at 9255 Military Trail in Navarre, Florida. We have a regular Sabbath service every Saturday. Uh, The service uh, starts about 1 o'clock. Uh, uh, we have a time of fellowship really from about 12.30 to 1.15 with bagels and coffee. You're invited to come out and have that fellowship. And we sound the shafar at 1.30. We begin our service. We'd love for you to come out. We also have a Tuesday night Bible study. Every Tuesday night we've been in the book of Isaiah. But this week we're going to have a sort of a special uh, 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 service on Tuesday night where we're going to talk about preparedness, how to m- prepare foods and how to... Uh, put them in five-gallon buckets and keep them where they last for years and years. They're kind of prepared this thing, especially for the area we live in, you know. Yeah, we do live in an area where we get hit by hurricanes yes. and different things where preparedness makes yeah. common sense. So it's actually going to be a hands-on thing this weekend for that, for people who want to come out and learn about how to do all that and how to do it inexpensively, too, is to just go buy the big things that are already prepared. So we're doing that this we're doing that this week, and uh, but normally we do have a Bible study on Tuesday night. We will resume that the next week. So come out and join us. You can find more about us at shalomnavar.com. That's shalomnavar.com. And I want to invite everybody to come out to Brit Am Messianic Synagogue at 6700 Spanish Trail in Pensacola. And this week on Monday, which is the fourth of July, <coughs> coming up not not Monday tomorrow, but a, uh, a week from. Uh, we're having a special cookout in time on the 4th of July. And then on the 23rd of July, we have special guest Greg Silverman, who is an amazing recording artist, Messianic recording artist and, and a choral director. He's got a doctorate degree in, in music arrangement, choral direction and stuff. But he's just a, just a wonderful, humble uh, worship leader, and he's going to be with us on the 23rd of July. So we're looking forward to having him with us and invite you to come on out and be part of that Tuesday night. We're having our Bible study regularly, and that is uh, we're teaching the words of Yeshua from a Judaic biblical perspective. And then a uh, regular Shabbat service on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. We also have a Torah study, which is just an interactive, very personal, uh, very uh, casual study that's held at the Drowsy Poet Coffee House on Wednesday evening at 5.30, and that's in Pensacola on Brent Lane. And then on Thursday evening, we have the same kind of a study uh, where we're studying that week's Torah Parsha together, and we're having that in Milton on Thursday evening at Camelot Junction. So if you'd like to come to either of those informal studies, uh, we welcome you to come out and either go to the Camelot Junction on Thursday evening at 6 in Milton or at the Drowsy Poet in Pensacola on Brent Lane on Wednesday at 5.30. So those are the upcoming events that are going on within our community. And then we're looking forward to in October. Now, it's a a pretty good ways away right now, but time goes by so fast. Uh, In October, we'll have our annual Sukkah Fest, and uh, we're 
preparing for that, we're going to have special guest Kira Goldman, Rabbi Frank Lowinger from Buffalo, New York, will be one of the special speakers, and we're going to have a great time during Sukkah Fest this year or our Sukkot or Tabernacles celebration. So that's some things coming up at Brit Am as awesome. well as at Am Yisrael. And uh, if you're in the Navarre, Fort Walton Beach uh, area, go by and visit Am Yisrael and tell them once again, what's the address? 9255 Military Trail in Navarre, Florida. And your website is? ShalomNavarre.com. And then Brit Am's website is ShalomPensacola.com. And the reason I wanted to give those websites is we had a question come in on our Facebook page, and it said, I'd like to listen to some of the previous radio programs. How can I do that? Well, how you do that is by going to either of our uh, websites, either ShalomNavar.com or ShalomPensacola.com, and the previous radio programs are archived on the websites, and you can go there and listen to them and catch up on any programs that you might have missed. I had a question come in uh, that says this. Uh, the word hallelujah, it seems to be universally used in Christian churches, sometimes without the initial letter H, and it's, it's uh, in the uses I'm familiar with, it's used as a form of praise itself. If it means praise God generally, how can we use it to praise God by saying praise God? Is it a compound word or a single word is, uh, in usage? And the word hallelujah is actually, it's a compound word. It's one word made up of two words, as many Hebrew words are. The first word comes from hallel, which means to praise. It's the masculine form. It's an active verb. It's not a... Uh, it's an active word, action word. And then the last part is the word yah, which is the short poetic term uh, or a, ver a version of the name of God. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is when, when you hear people saying yah this and yah that and just using it that way, they're inappropriately using the word yah. The word yah biblically, that, that shortened uh, name, uh, is used only in poetry in the Bible. It's never used outside of the poetic forms. We see it in the Psalms. Uh, we see it in Revelation as it's used in a poetic form. And so we have to understand that the, the, the shortened word or a shortened uh, nickname, uh, not nickname so much as the shortened form of the word uh, for the four-letter name of God, the yod heh vav -Hey, is uh, is used only in poetry. So if somebody uses it outside of the poetic format, they're inappropriately using that word because it's only used in the Bible and poetry. But it actually means the word hallelujah is a Hebrew word which means praise God. Now what's interesting is that it's used in the scripture to introduce a time of praising God. In other words, it's not just something that we say like, as often in common usage, Rabbi Wayne might say to me, "Hey, um, we had you know 25 visitors come to our synagogue this week," and and I might respond in the modern format by saying, "Praise God," but but that's not real. It's not a response. It's not like saying, "Hi, how are you? I'm fine." It's not a responsive word, but it's actually a word that means I'm praising God or we're going to praise God together. So it's used uh, in the Psalms. It'll be used in, in many of them at the beginning of the Psalm. And it's an, in, it's an insight to uh, or incitement to begin praising. OK, mm -hmm. now everybody praise God. And then in between the OK, everybody, let's all praise God together. There's a whole lot of praising God words and, and phrases that are used. And then it ends up by saying, because of all we just said, let's praise Him again. So it's an instruction to praise God more than it is just a proclaiming that we do praise God. Because it's an active thing. It's a word that we actually respond to the call to praise God. Uh, so it's important that we, we say that. For instance, I've been to... Uh, to uh, churches to teach and I've heard for instance a pastor or a worship leader might get up and he'll he'll say praise the Lord it's good to be here today but there'll be no response from the congregation other than praise they might say praise the Lord back or something but there's no real 
follow-up of praise of actually getting up and raising hands and clapping hands and worshiping and speaking words of worship and, and singing songs of worship at that moment. It's, it's almost become a greeting or a, a salutation rather than an invitation and an incitement to praise. So the word hallelujah is a Hebrew word. <laughs> it's interesting that in every language I'm familiar with, the word hallelujah stays the same uh, no matter what language you're in. It, it may drop the letters like H. It might become alleluia instead of hallelujah, depending on how the word is transliterated. But the word itself is consistent in every language that I know of. So it's one Hebrew word that's consistent all the way through. Amen is another word that's usually consistent in languages. And uh, we're not going to get into talking about what amen means, but it's not really uh, necessarily what we use it for in modern usage either. So to answer the question, the word hallelujah means praise God. And it doesn't. Ju it's not a greeting or a salutation, or but it's actually a in, an encouragement or an invitation to begin praising Him, as we see it. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, important. And and thank you for asking that question. It should always come from the heart. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. Or it does become just a greeting or whatever, and that's 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 when it's when we're living the way we should, when we're walking the way we should, when we're, uh, as the scripture said, praying without ceasing and and being of a worshipful heart all the time. Uh, when somebody says praise God or gives a reason to praise God, our reaction response. Uh, our nature should be to actually begin to praise God, to to not just say a word, but actually do that uh, praising God, worship Amen. and thanking Him and being thankful and worshipful and humbled by all that He has done yes. for us, in us, and to us. I want to remind our listeners that they can call in by dialing 623-1330, 623-1330, or you can go to our Facebook page, in the beginning radio program that's in the beginning radio program and our program is sponsored and supported by the messianic communities across the gulf coast one of those is congregation maim chaim the eastern shores messianic synagogue congregation maim chaim is located at 10526 County Road 64 in Daphne, Alabama. And you can find out more information about them by going to shalomeasternshore.com. That's shalomeasternshore.com. And their regular scheduled service begins at 1030 on Saturday mornings. They also have a Tuesday night dinner and then study. Uh, the dinner's at 6 o'clock, the study is at 7 o'clock, and Rabbi David and Rebitz and Danielle invite you to come out and join them at Congregation Mayim Chaim, the Eastern Shores Messianic Synagogue. Mm -hmm. You know, Rabbi Wayne, as we are talking earlier about this week's Parsha, and, and when I was answering Chase's question about the chrono chronology of the Scripture, this week's Parsha, we learn a number of things, and, and some things that our listeners may be aware of and familiar with, and others that, that they may not be. But in Numbers 8 begins our Parsha this week, and uh, as the Parsha begins, the opening statement is about uh, the menorah and where it's supposed to be located and how the light is supposed to shine from the menorah and what it's supposed to shine on. And, and it's a directional thing. The scripture says the light is supposed to shine forward and forward from the menorah was the table of showbread, which uh, represents the word of God. And the word of God had to be replaced uh, weekly. Every week it had to be fresh. And so we go through our parashot each week. Each week we have a new portion of scripture just like they had a new portion of the bread of the table of showbread and that without the light of God without that shining of that light on the word we will not be able to receive what the word has As a matter of fact I believe Romans tells us the carnal mind is enmity mm -hmm. or against the word of God and it cannot know it it cannot follow the Torah it cannot uh, follow the law of God. It's against the ways of God, but it takes 
the shining of the Ruach HaKodesh, the shining of God's Spirit, in order for us to see the Word of God in the way that He wants us to see it. Otherwise, we read the Word of God from a carnal standpoint. What does it mean to be carnal? It means to be fleshly. It means to make your flesh your God, your reasoning, your purpose, rather than God uh, as our purpose and our reason for doing things. And so the, the menorah light shines in that direction. We're remembering that the menorah was in the holy place, which was a closed tent. So the only light that was available there would have been the light from the menorah. And that light not only shined on the table of showbread, but it also shined on the altar of incense. The altar of incense represents our prayer and our worship, our praise. And the only way we can truly pray the right way you know, in, in uh, much of Judaism, there are liturgical prayers that are said. Uh, we say the Shema and the Vahavta. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elheinu Adonai Echad Vahavta Ed Adonai Elchecha B'chol Levavcha B'chol Nafshka B'chol Matecha Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be His glorious kingdom forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. It's part of liturgical prayer. It's part of a prayer that we say, the, the Kaddish, uh, the uh, Veshamru, the different prayers that we pray that are liturgical. In other, for, in, in, in other uh, backgrounds, faith backgrounds, there's liturgy that is said in the, the Methodist Church or the Episcopal Church or even in the Catholic Church. And there's nothing wrong with liturgy, but there is something wrong with liturgy without light. Mm. When you're just repeating vain repetitions, re there's nothing wrong with repeating something. The problem is when it becomes vanity, when it becomes a dead thing, when there's no light to it. And so our prayer and our worship can't just be wrote. It can't just be reading what's what we wrote over and over and over without any kevana, without any intention of heart. But it has to have the light of the menorah shining on it. And of course the menorah is one of the perfect examples in the scripture of Yeshua. Uh, the central light of it's called the um, the servant candle. And then all the other lights of it point towards that central candle. It, it represents the seven spirits of God mm -hmm. from uh, the book of Isaiah. And it's just such a powerful picture of who Yeshua is and that our light must come from Him, that we are reflections of His light and that the only way we can understand the Scriptures correctly is by looking at it through His light and the only way we can pray and worship correctly is also by His light. Yeah, because the 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 oil that's in, that's in the lampstand too represents the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and Yeshua said, I'm the light of the world. And so we're a reflection, we're light that He puts His Spirit in us. And when if we, allow the, if we allow the oil run out, you remember the five foolish and the five wise virgins, and uh, they let their oil run out, the five foolish. We let our oil run out, we get into trouble because when the oil runs out, the light begins to flicker and it goes out. Right, and, so and that oil comes from Him. Comes not from, from Him. Us. Yes, comes from Him. Absolutely. Seth, welcome to the program. Good morning, Rabbi. Good Shalom. morning. Shalom. Good morning. Shalom, Rabbi Wayne. Shalom to you. Blessings. Good to hear you guys team tag teaming together. Awesome. It's good to be back together again. Yeah. You know, Rabbi Wayne took like four weeks off in a row. <laughs> I'm not understanding what's going on with that. You know, I I tried to get him to go with him and his wife to go with us on our vacation cruise this last week, but they didn't want to come for some reason. I don't understand. I, I you would think if one of your best friends were to call you and say, Hey, would you like to go to the Bahamas for a few days with us? That you know they would just drop everything and go, but for some reason they think paying their bills and finishing their work is a priority. I just don't understand that. <laughs> yeah, his creditors appreciate that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I got a question for you. Certainly. The program that came on just before your program started. Uh, I hope I misunderstood, it, but the gentleman sort of referred to, as I understood him, to say Jerusalem as a wretched place. I've never heard anybody use that particular descriptive word, but I just wonder for any listeners that might have heard his program 
and they're wondering uh, what makes Jerusalem special and why should it be, uh, I should say, worthy of <sighs> occupying, let's use that word, and I wondered if you might just address that. Well, for the general listeners, okay, and I'll hang up. Okay, first of all, Jerusalem's a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to say that there's some things that people may not understand historically. And one of those things is that Israel, at one point, was an amazingly beautiful forested land. But because for a period of time, taxes were based upon the amount of trees on your property. The people of Israel, like people in America, responded to that by saying, okay, we'll just get rid of the trees. If they're going to charge us by the tree, we'll just reduce the number of trees. So there was a a defoliation that happened in Israel, which ended up causing much of the nation to become a desert. And it was a result of taxes. You know, there's there's a real truth that taxes kill and taxes cause death. And uh, in this case, it was the death of trees. So by the time we see people like Mark Twain coming to the picture in <coughs> modern times, Israel, uh, pre the reestablishment of Israel uh, in 48, was a pretty desolate place. Mm-hmm. And you would look at Israel and say, this is a, a really a desert place. There's not many trees. There's not much water. There's not much going on. There's no real cities. There's nothing going. Why would anybody be fighting over a land that seems to hold no real desirable qualities. And the reason is because the reason they fight over it is because God placed his name there. There's a spiritual value to the land, even if the land at that time didn't seem to present any monetary value or any value in aesthetics. Now, of course, if you go to Israel, and again, I I talked about people going to Israel with me in November. You go to Israel, there's trees have been planted. It's, It's the only country in the world that has more trees every year than less trees every year. Every year there's more and more trees planted. People plant trees in Israel uh, to celebrate and commemorate events like weddings and funerals and bar and bat mitzvahs and special events, graduations. Any excuse to plant another tree in Israel is a good excuse. So now it's become an, a really beautiful city. It's a gem in in that area. And so you go to Jerusalem and, and there's beautiful buildings and beautiful hotels and and uh, museums and shopping places and it's just uh, and the western wall and and all the things that are going on there. So it's a it's an absolutely beautiful place now, but there was a period of time when it was a desolate place. Now, I don't know that I would ever call it wretched, uh but it was desolate. Uh yeah, you know, Robert, I was thinking uh, about about Israel, I didn't. I, I don't know what the context was of the gentleman's uh, message that was on before us because I did not hear that, so I can't speak to that. But uh, what I can say is that uh, throughout Israel's history, uh, at times they were in great disobedience to God, and we know that because they were sent out from the land. That was their punishment, and so there was times when the land became, and it was prophesied, would become desolate uh, because of Israel's rebellion, and that the land would get its Sabbath rest that they uh, neglected to honor God by. But the good news from all this is, and as we've been watching in our lifetime, is the restoration of the land is taking place. Uh, God is uh, bringing restoration to Israel and Aliyah, and people are going back to Israel, and it's a continual thing that's going on until Messiah comes and brings a full restoration to the land. So uh, while we're in the midst of war and many things going on, uh, in the midst of all this, Israel is still in a period of restoration. Absolutely. And, the, you know, the scriptures, there's a prophetic word that says, can a nation be born in a day? Mm-hmm. And Israel is the only nation that after 2,000 years of being desolate was rebirthed in a day. So that's really important for us to realize that these are not just historical things but these are prophetic things and fulfillments of prophecy that are happening even the language the original language being restored uh i mean there's no way in the natural that all this could even happen so it is a spiritual thing it is the god of abraham isaac and jacob that has said this would happen and it is happening And and will continue to happen 
we have a message that says uh, from Herb, okay, I understand from what you said that the radio shows were recorded and are on Shalom Pensacola and ShalomNavar.com. I've searched and cannot find them. I see Shalom Pensacola as a rabbi's cor- corner, which has sermons and teachings where I find the Shabbat and Tuesday night teachings. I can't find the program. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, Herb, what I'll do, because I'm not able to look at the website right now and navigate it while I'm talking on the radio, but I will send you a... Uh, a message on Facebook to let you know how to find the uh, Saturday, uh, Sunday morning radio programs. I do know that if you go to Shalom Navar, there's a tab there that says, I think it says YouTube, or yeah. to follow, and you can follow it there also. There's, it should I'd, be really easy on ours. Yeah, so I would encourage you to check that out, and in the meantime, I will uh, find the tab that it's under and make sure that... Uh, that you can get that. So we want to make sure that all of our listeners can follow up and look back at past programs. The reason we record them is so that people can listen to the past programs and follow up on uh, on what's going on with our program. And uh, by the way, if you're listening to our program and you have not liked our Facebook page, we encourage you to do so. On our Facebook page, we post the links to, for instance, Natasha Krauss Reynolds' music and Tamara Alexander's music. The link to the uh, Israel trip is on there now. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to place a link to the Messianic Times because I know that there are people out there that read regularly our Messianic Times website, the MessianicTimes.com, and uh, and go there to find out what's happening globally around the world with the Messianic movement. One of the neatest things that I've seen happen lately, Rabbi Yitzhak Shapira, who's been a, ra- a guest on our program a few times here live, uh, just went to Bogota. Colombia had an amazing meeting there. And not only was it a meeting of Messianics and Christians, but the head rabbi of Bogota was in attendance at the meeting and they had a a separate meeting for people to interact with him as well as Rabbi Shapira and Rabbi Italki was there and and so there's an amazing thing as as they uh, went to Bogota and had this meeting where not only were there uh, Christians who were interacted with to show them the Judaic roots, the, the biblical roots of their faith and why they do those things but there was also a great interaction with the uh, the traditional or rabbinic uh, Jewish component of Bogota, and they had a great time there. Uh, we're going to have an article in the upcoming Messianic Times in the September October edition with more information about what all's happened in that on our print paper that you can get either in print or digitally. But uh, some of the things with the show on the Messianic Times. A website are shortened stories and articles about events like that. So if you want to know what's going on around the world through the Messianic movement, you can go to MessianicTimes.com. That's MessianicTimes.com. Not only can you find out about what's going on in the Messianic Times, but you can subscribe to it. And it only costs $9.99 a year to subscribe digitally to the newspaper. It's $29.99 a year to get the actual physical paper. And that donation helps us to continue to reach out to Jewish people and non-Jewish people in 170 nations around the world, including countries like Lebanon and Syria and Iraq. We have readers in Afghanistan and Turkey, as well as all throughout the Far East, China and uh, Hong Kong and through Australia and uh, throughout the former Soviet Union, Central and South America. We have readers in 170 different countries that regularly come and read about the Messiah on our website and uh, get our newspaper digitally. So your support uh, for the Messianic Times and our outreach through that is greatly appreciated. And so we encourage you to go to our website, MessianicTimes.com. I want to uh, also remind you that our program is sponsored, supported by the Messianic communities across the Gulf Coast. Uh, one of those is Beta Israel. Beta Israel is the Messianic congregation in Bayou La Battery, Alabama. Their service times are 10. Uh, 15 to 10:45 is an Ask the Rabbi session. At 11 o'clock, they have their Shabbat service, and they meet at. 8340 East Rabbi Street in Biola Batra. I always read that and I want it to say Rabbi Street. <laughs> It'd be so cool if it was 8340 East Rabbi, R-A-B-B-I Street, but it's 8340 East Rabbi, R-A-B-B-Y 
Street in Biola Battery. And I know that Rabbi Paul and Sally would love to have you come visit them at their congregation as they worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords together every Shabbat as part of their uh, service uh, to him and being part of our community across the Gulf Coast. You know, Rabbi Eric, when we was talking earlier from the first question that came in about the New Covenant believers and all that and the four things required, you know, in the, in the Torah it was the same four things when the Gentiles would come and join to the house of Israel even back in those days. And uh, in, in the Brit HaDashah also uh, was prophesied about in Jeremiah 31 and 31 fulfilled uh, uh, in the Brit HaDashah itself in the, book of, in the book of Hebrews, but it was made to the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And the two would become one restored in Messiah. And so we see that um, that Yeshua himself chose his apostles, uh, his disciples amongst the Jewish people. And they were trained, and they were trained by him and brought into the full understanding. And that's why it's important that we're careful about the leadership that we're under, that we are being taught properly according to the Word of God in the way the early congregation was set up in the order that it is set up in. Absolutely. You know, there's a biblical uh, mandate for leadership that uh, was given in the Scripture, both in the Tanakh, or the Torah and the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, that there was, for instance, Moses, and then there were the uh, the elders the, in this particular week's passage there's 70 elders that are chosen in order to assist Moses in doing it. it's not yeah. just everybody gets to say I want to be a leader and they just step out and lead but there's a process for that and these leaders that are chosen are chosen because if you read the scripture that they have a record of being accountable of doing what they were asked you know, the, in the Brit Kadashah, they're choosing seven men full of the Ruach HaKodesh that were leaders, that had experience, that were men of knowledge, that knew what they were doing. It wasn't just, hey, you, come do this. And, and they were not new believers either. Right. They were not novices, uh, but they were people that had an experiential uh, uh, history that they could look at and see. They were uh, princes of Israel is one of the, the terms that were used. They were exampled leaders that were chosen to be in positions of authority. Trained in the Word of God, full, full of the Spirit, had walked and had experienced life and lived out life and had, had uh, met all the qualifications. And there are qualifications. And then they were not... They were not voted upon, Rabbi Eric. They were chosen by men of God who already met those qualifications because they could discern and see that they met those qualifications. So that's how God would work through them. Right, and they were chosen by other leaders. Yes, not voted upon. Right, it wasn't that the, the people got together and said, here's somebody, we like him. Right. Uh, it was chosen, uh, Moses was chosen by God, and then God instructed Moses to choose leaders and gave qualifications for those leaders. In Timothy, it gives us qualifications for, uh, in English translations, it says bishop, but the word there is actually shepherds or pastors or leaders of, of communities. And those there were qualifications that were there. Uh, they had to be able to teach. They had to be able. They had to have good control of their family, as far as their family worshiping together and, and being walking in the right direction. There were requirements of people for leadership. It wasn't just, "Hey, uh, what are you doing today? Why don't you come out and do this?" Or somebody who just said, "I want to be a teacher, so I'm going to do this." We don't see that happening in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, even Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul who was one of the most learned men of his day as far as uh, Bible school knowledge, so to speak. He studied under the feet of Gamaliel, one of the greatest known teachers of Judaism, still submitted himself to the authority of the leadership in Jerusalem, who, when we look at their records, were not as educated or qualified scholarship-wise as Paul was, yet he submitted to their leadership and their authority and their covering before he did anything, and he went and spent time with them and with other leaders before he went out on his own 
to go teach the word. Well, Eric, is there a difference between because uh, uh, you know I'm hearing you uh, talk about this the word covering versus God's authority on someone, God's leadership on someone. Well, the the you know modern we talk about the word covering. Biblically, we're talking about an authority, and the authority comes from God. And for instance, in the case we see where Moses, Moses is given his authority by God, but then he is given the authority to pull, pick, and raise up other leaders who right. served under Moses's authority. For instance, Joshua, who was Moses's mentee. Yeah, Moses was his mentor. He raised him up. He taught him mm-hmm. what to do. But Joshua served under the authority of Moses. About Aaron 40, about served. 40 years, didn't yeah, he? Aaron served under the authority of Moses. Now Moses got his authority from God, but the other men served under him. Timothy and Barnabas all served under the authority of Paul. Paul was the leader, but Paul served under the authority of uh, Jude, uh, James, rather in Jerusalem. So you know, Jude, Jerusalem Council. There's James and the other leaders sent Paul forward to go. They gave him the authority to go and do what he did under the authority of God. They didn't just decide to do it, but they prayed, sought God, and through the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, they then laid hands on Paul, gave smicha, or ordination, to Paul, who then went out under their authority. He submitted himself to them, and they sent him forth to do what he did. And then the men that went with Paul... Uh, Mark and Barnabas and Titus and Timothy and others who served under the authority of Paul submitted to Paul and went and did the things that they did. So, so uh, the the authority and and the modern word covering, the modern word covering is just a, a, another way of saying the same thing, right? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And we have you. about one minute left of the program. I want to encourage you. Uh, to go to a Messianic synagogue near you, whether it's Am Yisrael in Navarre or Beit Israel in Mobile or Congregation Maim Chaim in Daphne or Brit Am in Pensacola. And I also want to encourage you, if you've never been to Israel, you need to come join us Amen. on this trip in November. Thank you so much for joining the program. Shalom and Shavuot. Shavuot. In the beginning was God, was the Word. Which was true light, which gives light to all in the 